morning. And I have to say, I bear the evidence, a witness, I rubbed my stomach, that I've been eating good, no, that we have baptisms today. Uh, what an awesome thing at all four campuses, God is at work today. Come on, somebody celebrate, let's thank God. Today we kick off a new message series uh, called Big Dreams and Big Challenges. And uh, it's, I love talking about dreams. I think everybody has a dream. A lot of people have given up on dreams. But God puts things in our hearts because he loves us and he, we're like him. And we have a creative God. And so it's only natural that his people would also be creative. And you want to do more with what you have and believe God for big things. Uh, are there any dreamers in the house today? Any dreamers in the house? Amen. Uh, so, somebody... The, the, the tread on the tires is a little bald on, on some of us, you know. Uh, one more time, let's awaken that. Any dreamers in the house today? Yeah. And everybody truly does. And I just want to say, if you've survived some broken dreams as well, welcome to the club. Because I would also say, how many of you have had some bad dreams, some nightmarish dreams? You wish things had gone differently. Come on. Proof. Proof that you survived. Proof that you survived. If you're still breathing, God is still working, right? So you may have come in here today driving a hoopty of a body and a hoopty of a heart. Your, your, your feelings are hurt. You've been stabbed in the back. You've been talked about, put on blast on Facebook. Anybody? Anybody? Hey, this, this week I, had, I, w I was told on my own social media I had to block somebody. They said they reported me to the IRS. <laughs> reported me to the IRS, I guess, because I said something that offended them. In church, let me just say, in case you're taking notes, get out a pencil because it ain't slowing down at all, right? Not slowing down at all. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, if you want to see your dreams realized, you have to kind of toughen up a little bit because dreaming is not for the faint of heart. I, I would like to qualify that just a little bit because it's not enough to dream you. At some point, you have to put down the coffee cup and the conversations, and you have to go from dreaming to doing. A lot of people like to talk. Not a lot of people like to walk the walk. And let me tell you, that's where you get the boys separated from the men. And, you know, even the strongest men will have their hearts broken and their dreams dashed. And I just want to say to you, Pathway Church, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, hang in there. Hang, don't, don't hang in there just to make it, but hang in there and ask God that he would do what he said he would do. What did he say? He said that he would do exceedingly abundantly more than you could ask or think. And so if your feelings are a little hurt, you're a little bit tired, you're skint up, your knuckles are skint, um, you're, you're feeling like an Alabama fan in 2023, if that's, if that's how you feel on the inside, then let me just say, the really great things in life, the things that God has called you to are worth fighting for. And some of the greatest victories that you will ever have is just not giving up after you've been brutalized, after you've been brokenhearted, after you've been disappointed. And so for everybody that showed up today and you're tired and you're still going, thank God for you. Come on, one more time, one more time. Amen. Now we're going to look at this idea of big dreams and big challenges by looking at the life of Joseph. We're going to do that over the next seven weeks. And when we're talking about Joseph, we're talking about one of the most righteous men in the whole Bible. Now, I'm not saying he didn't have problems, because he did. When he started out, Joseph was a little bit wobbly. I mean, God had promised some things, and he didn't know how to keep his dreams on the inside. There's some things that you should just never speak about, the things that aren't ready for prime time, things that you shouldn't say out loud yet. There, there's a time and a place for it. Sometimes if you bring your dreams out into the sunlight too early, you know, people laugh at them. They'll, they'll work against you. They'll conspire against you. They might throw you in a pit. They might sell you to slave traders. That could possibly happen. This is exactly what happened to Joseph. And I would just say, when God has placed something in your heart, there, there's a time for it to germinate between you and the Lord to be a matter of prayer. A lot of times, the dreams that you're given, they're given to you when you're at a time of formation where your shoulders are not strong enough. You're not formed enough yet for the work that God wants to do in your life. Joseph was one of the most righteous men in the Bible, second maybe only to Daniel, maybe only to John the Baptist. Both were noted by the scriptures as being righteous. Jesus said there is no better man on all the earth 
than John the Baptist. But Joseph is right there. Joseph's story and journey is very similar to Daniel's. Both uh, went into slavery. Both um, came up in the most difficult, persecuted way to rise to the highest levels of authority uh, in the land. And that's just encouragement, I think, for all of us today, that no matter where you start, there is no situation, no circumstance, no matter what's happened to you, there is no happenstance that's bigger than the destiny that God's placed on your life. So I don't care what kind of family you've come from. I don't care if you're the first generation Christian in your family lineage. I don't care if you've come to Christ late in your life. Here's what I would say is that when God has placed his hand on your life, there's nobody that can block what God wants to do. Amen. Come on, we can thank the Lord for that. Go with me to Genesis chapter 37. And let's just take a look at, um, let's just take a look at, at Joseph's starting point here. The Bible says in verse 1, So Jacob settled again in the land of Canaan, where his father had lived as a foreigner. This is the account, this is the account of Jacob and his entire family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. Just pause there just for a second because a lot of, a lot of people with visions of grandeur for their life, they want to skip the pasture. Amen. They want to skip the pasture. I've had people, even people that I'm working with in ministry would say, Pastor, how can I get discovered? How can I be noticed? How can I get platformed? And I've said very directly to them, you don't need to be, you don't need to be discovered. You need to be developed. You need to be developed. So many people are wanting to be discovered before they're developed. They're, they're pl promotions that God wants to bring you into that you aren't ready for. Don't despise the days when you're tending sheep in your father's field, right? When you're working for someone else's dream, when you're working for someone else's uh, blessing, that's a blessing for your, for your life yourself. It says he worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah, but Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. So I just want you to keep in mind the youngest brother who's working for his stepbrothers, um, working for his stepbrother's mom and, and his dad. And because you will see here that uh, in verse 4 that is, his father loved him so much because Joseph was born to his father Jacob when Jacob was an old man. And I, I, I kind of am feeling like I understand what that's about because I, I, don't know how, I don't know how it goes for you, but usually, now I'm speaking as a firstborn, the firstborn is the guinea pig in all family discipline. Can I get a witness today? Can I get a witness? Um, now, let me just pause there for a second. You know, scientifically, the firstborn is smarter. I, I, I see that hand. Right. Um, so, I, so if my brother Philip is watching, let's put that out there. Um, but the reason is because the firstborn is learning from the parents and the younger brothers and sisters are learning from the firstborn. So just think about that. Don't get too excited that you're the smartest. If, you're, if your younger brothers and sisters are the dumbest, they have you to give credit for that. <laughs> but when it, gets to, when it gets to Joseph, when it gets to Joseph, Jacob is not dealing out spankings. Anybody come up in life for you? Yeah, spankings. Oh, what about whoopings? Because a spanking and a whooping isn't quite the, the difference. But when your dad says, son, I want you to go on outside because I don't want to get blood on your mama's carpet, you're, that's a whole uh, other level there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I think Jacob had just gotten tired. He had just gotten tired. And then really Joseph could do no harm. And then because of that affinity that was going on from Joker, Jacob to Joseph, he, he really wasn't. He was like the chosen one. You know, he was, he was precious. 
Verse 3, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. Now, how do you, let me just ask, this is the condition. How do you think the brothers are going to be? Talk, talk back to me. I mean, yeah, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem. Um, and, you know, parents don't love all their kids the same way because all the kids are differently. But parents love their children fully, fully. Um, Joseph loved, was loved by Jacob more than any of the other kids. And Joseph wasn't shy about it. In fact, he gave him a coat of many colors that none of the other boys got. In our family, it, me as a son, uh, you come down to the last piece of cake, the last piece of cake, you got two boys and one piece of cake. What do you do? The, <laughs> well, there is the one school of survival of the fittest, you know. It's like the family of 12, there was one piece of chicken left, and the lights went out, and like three people got a fork in the back of their hand, you know. It's like, <laughs> but in our house... If there was one piece of cake, the rule was there's one cutter and one chooser. So just think about the psychology of that. It takes about 10 minutes to measure that cake. It's the most precisely sliced cake in the history of all cakes, right? Now, not Joseph. He, did, he was like, not Jacob. He was like, Jacob or Joseph, you can just have the cake. It, it was very clean, very out front. And it was a problem. It was a problem. And then Joseph would go back and report that he was being bullied, he was being abused. And that was true. It, there's no excuse for that. But I'm just telling you that there were dynamics here that were really challenging. Today I want to talk to you about this very thing, about how to thrive. You have a dream, how to thrive in dysfunction. Say that with me. How to thrive in dysfunction. One more time, really good and strong. How to thrive in dysfunction. Now every single one of us came up in dysfunction. There's no one here that has not experienced dysfunction, is not experienced this experiencing dysfunction right now, and is not purveying it. It's just a part of the human experience. Are there things that you do, and though even though even though it's you and you think that you are right almost all the time, you can still say, you know, I do some things that actually cause me problems. Is that true? So we're all in dis- dysfunction. I think what I wanted to do in starting out this series today and and talking to you about Joseph's life is I wanted to let you know that God's biggest dreams are not reserved for God's most perfect people with the best starting places. In fact, I I would really warn you, be careful about being envious about other people's situations, about what other people have, about who other people are, what they've come from. Well, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. But don't worry about that. That, That's a waste of your time. And in addition to that, let me just be real honest with you. I'm about to step on your toes, but it's biblical. You should not be envious. You should not be jealous. It's a violation of the Ten Commandments. Let me say, Pathway Church, whenever someone at, at a Foley campus or South Haven campus or airport campus or Moffat campus, whenever anybody does well with something in life, it's not the time for you to down that person. It's time for you to celebrate that your brother or your sister is blessed. I mean, think about it. If somebody at Pathway Church is blessed, then the whole church is blessed. Don't worry about other people. Worry about you. But God has dreams for all people everywhere. And he has specific plans. And we, he is the constant. We are the variable. Are we going to cooperate with his plan? Now, I just really encourage you today, go home, write down some of your dreams, reignite those, put it in your Bible. You know, one of my dreams is that all my children would know Jesus and love Jesus and serve Jesus and pass on the gospel to their children after they get married. I want all my kids to get married. I want them all to get married. I want them all to have kids. I want all those kids to grow up in the house of the Lord with the word of God written in their heart and being awesome at whatever it is they do. I don't want my kids to rise to mediocrity. I don't want my grandkids to 
just barely make it. I don't, I don't want them to go through life like Eeyore with their tail always falling off. You know what I'm saying? I want whatever it is they do. They don't have to make the most money, but whatever it is that God has called them to do, I want them to be the best that they can possibly be at that thing. That's, my, that's one of my dreams, right? And I'm assuming of most fathers and mothers would have that same kind of dream, especially for those that are followers of Jesus Christ. But these dreams don't happen in a, in a vacuum. Pastor, I'm really excited that you're preaching this message today, but you just don't know, you just don't know what I've come from. Well, you don't know what I've come from either, A. And then B, I think there's probably very few people that have come from what Joseph has come from. And I, I want you to look at just how dysfunction, how, how much dysfunction was in his life. One day Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe, but his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word about him. Let's just talk about Joseph just for a second. I want to help set this up. I think you're just going to be encouraged by some of this history. Joseph is one of the 12 tribes of Judah. Now, when you're reciting the 12 tribes of Judah, for those of you that learned that in Sunday school or you learned that in Bible class or Bible college or you learned it from reading the scripture, you're going, well, where is the tribe of Joseph? Because I don't recall the tribe of Joseph. The tribe of Joseph is called the tribes, the half-tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. And those are Joseph's boys. And God doubly blessed him uh, for this. The tribes of Israel are really interesting, and they were all given portions of land. So Ephraim and Manasseh, they got portions of land. And, you know, Joseph, because of the dysfunction in his family, he didn't really get a chance to get a portion of his land because he, his life went on a different trajectory when his brothers threw him in a pit and sold him to slavery. He went into Egypt, you know. He went into Potiphar's home, then he went into prison, and the, the bread maker and the wine taster. You, you know this whole story. We're, we're going to get to that. And then he ends up at the top, number two to the, to the Pharaoh. And this, oh man, the story is awesome. I mean, it's got so many plot twists. It's, it's incredible. He was over all of Egypt. So it was his boys. It was his boys that got the land. Now there were people in Israel that did not get a, por- a portion of land like the Levites. They were tending over the church and or over worship over the temple. And so that's really where some of the idea of tax-exempt status comes from. Or like we have a non-pathway church is a not-for-profit. And, and so like you give and then we oversee it and there's, we have elders in the church to help it. We have, you know, trustees that help navigate that sort of thing. But, you know, when I die, I don't will pathway church to my kids, right? There'll be another pastor that steps in. And so it's really, really interesting. Joseph, his apportionment went to Ephraim and to Manasseh. And then the other 11 went to the other brothers that threw him in a pit. Also encouragement today too, because you could be on the giving end of abuse. And I want you to know that God is not finished with you. Aren't you thankful that your past is not held against you in eternity if you place your trust in Jesus. Now, uh, the the great church hymn that goes something like this, um, don't try me, try Jesus, because I throw hands, you know. Um, That comes into play because if you do stuff, stupid things here on this earth, you'll go to jail, right? But there is no jail that can lock up the promise of God and God's purpose in your life. And so I also want to encourage you just here today in the middle of your dysfunction that there's nothing that you have ever done that can separate you from the love of God if you'll place your trust in him. That's the good news of the gospel. That's the good news of the gospel. Oh, I'm so tired of the church. The church is so holier than thou. No, no, that's Jesus is holy. And if we're standing with Jesus, it's not because of how holy we are. It's because of how holy he is. And he is saved and he's rescued us. So now Joseph, 
you know, received an inheritance. He was, he was born of Jacob and Rachel. And he was known by his brothers. And he was known, um, he was known in the scriptures by people as the righteous one. He was favored by his father. And then, of course, we know that he was sold into slavery by his brothers as a cover-up. And also because one of his brothers advocated for him after his other brothers had conspired to kill him. So slavery was a compromise between a brother that stood for him and brothers that wanted to kill him. So just, just think about that. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of family dysfunction. Amen? Now I want you to think about just how dysfunctional his family was. Because we think, we say things like, I serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had some problems. In fact, think about, think about Joseph's great-grandfather, Abraham, how that God had promised to bless him with so many descendants. He was an old man, and he thought that God needed some help, so he ends up, he and Sarah end up having a conversation and decide that Abraham is going to hook up with her handmaid, Hagar. Remember, let me just tell you really quick. God is not a little old man that needs help crossing the street, right? I will come to a point in my life where I'm going to need help getting up the stairs. Not, I'm not there yet. My heart and my mind are 18. My left knee is about 87, you know. Don't agree too much with that, Lawrence. I heard that. I'm not making eye contact with you, but I hope you can feel it right now in the second row. <laughs> Abraham thought that God needed some help. That's pretty dysfunctional that you get an agreement to have a child with somebody else while you're married. And God did not revoke his promise, but it did create some comp complexity, even in the world today. Like much of the dispute in the Middle East today, when you think of some call it Palestine. But if you read the scriptures, it would be known as Judea, Samaria. The descendants of Ishmael the son of Abraham and Hagar, They're, the lineage of Muslims is traced back to this brokenness in a promise that God had made and that Abraham didn't believe. There's a family dispute that goes on today between billions of people on the planet because of Joseph's great-grandfather. Just think about that just for a second. So this is what Joseph is growing up in. Now I want you to skip on down. I want you to go to verse, uh, Genesis chapter 37, verse 29. At this point in the story, I don't want to unpack the whole story, but at this point, Joseph was thrown into a pit. One brother interceded that he not be killed. And then verse 29 happens. The Bible says, so when the Ishmaelites who were Midianite traders, came by. Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver, and the traders took him to Egypt. I just want you to think about that for a second. Talk about dysfunction. And quite honestly, I hadn't really thought about the whole ramifications of this passage and the family connection. Joseph was not just sold into, sla into slavery by Midianite traders, but they were Ishmaelites, which is a direct fruit of Joseph's great-grandfather and Hagar. So Joseph's brothers would sell him into slavery to his third cousins. Can somebody just let that sit on you just for a second and think about the environment that Joseph is coming up in? That reminds me today that there is no dysfunction more powerful than the redeeming lift of God's grace. 
And here's, here's what I, Pastor, do you believe in prosperity theology? Look, here, here's what I believe in. I believe in redemption and lift. That's what I believe, is that I was redeemed and God lifted me out of a pit and he put me in a place I never could have dreamed of, I never could have achieved on my own. Is that your testimony? Once I was in bondage, but Jesus set me free. Is that how that song goes? Somebody could sing that, right? Right. I, I was blind, now I can see. I was crippled and now I can walk. I was in bondage, I was addicted, and now I'm free. I was broke and now God has, he has revoked the sin tax on my life. What do you mean? What is the syntax? It's a little bit lower down in your notes, but the syntax is the fee that Satan puts on your life for you not obeying the Lord. How many things is it that God calls you not to do, not so he can constrain your behavior, but so that he can bless you and cause you to be more like him, that you would follow after him? And not participating in those things will actually cause a financial blessing for your life or a physical blessing for your life or an emotional blessing for your life, or a psychological blessing for your life. There are some relationships, if you won't get involved in, then you won't have to see a counselor later. Pastor, are you, are you, saying, are you saying that we shouldn't get counseling? I'm not saying that, and I'm not saying that Getting counseling is acknowledging defeat. Listen, everybody needs to talk to somebody. There's some counseling that doesn't need to happen. Some of the things you need to have, have happen just to get a Christian friend. Just get a, a brother or sister in Christ. Get in a small group, you know? Get, get, get in the word of God. But if you need a counselor, get a counselor. You won't be the first. I, I, I've had a counselor. Dealing with you will make me need to get more counselors. <laughs> Like, don't be afraid of that. I see some of y'all really laughing. And I, I know, I know. But there's no dysfunction that's more powerful than God's ability to redeem you and lift you out of the pit. In fact, in fact, I would say those who have sinned the most and been forgiven the most have some of the greatest testimonies, and God does some incredible things because of you. In fact, don't hide your testimony. Tell your testimony. Share. Yeah, but pastor, if people knew, well, if people knew what Jesus could do, what would happen in them? The book of Revelation says that we are made overcomers by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So listen, if God has freed you from addiction, give thanks to God and let, let the world know that God, if he can redeem you, he can redeem them as well. Pastor, I, I, I know we're supposed to witness, but I don't know the Bible. Has God changed you? Has God saved you? Are you not who you used to be? Tell that. Tell that. Right. There's no dysfunction. Amen. Amen. But a lot of people get in these situations like Joseph, and they try and bring about the promises of God with the works of flesh. And let me tell you, you cannot achieve the promises of God with the works of the flesh. You cannot violate the character of God to walk in the blessings of God. You cannot work against God when God is trying to work for you. And I'm just going to be real straight here because, look, we are a holiness church. We are a Bible-preaching church. I, am, I never want to use a pop cultural argument as a way to refute something that's in the scripture. If there's something in the scripture that I don't like, the problem isn't in the scripture, the problem is in me. Is in me. The best thing that we could do is we can say, God, it doesn't matter what I see on the news, it doesn't matter what they're telling me in politics, it doesn't matter what people are saying I should be like, what ma it doesn't matter what kind of confusion I'm in, it doesn't matter, none of that stuff matters. All that matters is that I become like you. That I become like you. You can't achieve God's promises by violating God's character. And of course, that's what we saw in Abraham and Hagar. And that, that big problem, in fact, we complicate things uh, when this happens. I love Joseph shows us so much by his life. 
He was a little wobbly at the beginning because he was braggadocious. He was, it showed there was no discretion. His father gave him a, a gift. He flaunted the gift in front of his brothers. His dad should have known better. He should have known better. You can't hold the son too much at account because a father is supposed to teach a son a thing like that. There's a passage in the Bible that says that a warrior basically says a warrior shouldn't brag. A warrior that's walking onto the field shouldn't boast like a warrior that's walking off the field, right? Uh, In other words, when you go in the end zone, act like you've been there before, right? Joseph eventually comes about And he was righteous then, he had some problems, but as he goes through these challenges, it really refines him. And and let let me just encourage you in this today, that if you're going through something right now, then look for God's hand in the middle of your sickness. Look for God's hand in the middle of your financial difficulty. Look for God's hand in the middle of your relational dissonance. Because not everything bad that happens to you is from the enemy. But everything bad that happens to you, God will use it for his glory. But we've got to be at work partnering with the Lord. Listen, my dad would say that his best moments in ministry happened in the aftermath of Hurricane Andrew, which destroyed his house and destroyed his church. What Satan meant for evil, God used for good. People came to know Jesus that wouldn't have otherwise. And let, let me just say, if you're going through a storm right now, number one, keep going. Keep going. Don't quit. Don't quit. But as you go through a storm, as you go through a difficulty, make sure you look for Jesus in the storm. Look for him in the storm. Joseph shows us that we should be righteous and we should be holy and we should be dependent on God during the middle of our difficulty. And this, this, is, this is where I'd like to push back on us a little bit because... We seek God so many times for the gift and not for the giver of the gift. And I thank God that God gives good things. Aren't you thankful for that today? That God gives good things. But I'm so thankful that I have gotten to know God during the middle of the difficulty. So when Joseph is on his journey to the very top of the heap, We see in Joseph that faithfulness to God and righteousness in Christ is a reward in and of itself. Righteousness in Christ, in spite of the difficulties, is the blessing that we're actually seeking. I'm telling you, I've never one time been with someone on their deathbed where they were asking for more things. People always want to be, virtually always, want to be closer to Jesus and have a little bit more time with people. Let me tell you, things are not the reward. Jesus is the reward. The Holy Spirit is the reward. And let me tell you, in all of this, this life is but a vapor here today and gone the next. And let me tell you, our eternity, we will worship the Lord forever. It's not going to be boring. It's going to be, it's going to be incredible. We will be so awestruck by the presence of God that everything that we thought was important will melt away. Righteousness in Christ is the, re- is the reward. Isaiah chapter 62 and, and verse 17, the Bible says, and the work of righteousness will be peace. And the service of righteousness, quietness, and confidence forever. Go and do everything you can. Pathway Church, be as awesome as you can. Make memories, build wealth, you know, spend time with people, build something, leave the world better than you found it. You know, make make deposits in people's lives that are a blessing to them. But let me tell you, in all of that, if you do anything, get Jesus. Get Jesus. And then, Philip, if you go ahead and come, I would, I would close with this. Because God does want to bless us. Right? I, I don't diminish that. I don't, I don't want to minimize that. I just want to put it in its right place. But if you look to the scriptures, what you will see is that love for God 
Dependence on Jesus, dependence on God, righteousness precedes blessing. It precedes blessing. If you want a lasting blessing in your life, then trust in Jesus. If you ever remember anything that has ever been preached, remember this, to trust Jesus all the way. Every step of the journey. Matthew chapter six, verse 33, Jesus communicates this so well. He says that we should seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. I want you to stand with me today. I don't want us ever to be a church that pretends. I don't want to have a pretend move of God. I want to have a real move of God. I don't want to pretend to be holy. I want us to be holy, even as God is holy. I don't want to, be, I don't want to pretend to be in unity or to be one. I want us to be one. I want us to be close to Jesus. And I don't want us to dumb down our dreams. Pathway Church is evident that God blesses his people. And I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for the stories that are in this house. We have people to, here today that have been on the receiving end of some terrible things, but God is still faithful. We have some people who have faced some terrible circumstances and God is still faithful. The faithfulness of God is exhibited and evidenced even in the middle of dysfunction. Pathway Church, we should thrive in this environment. Pastor, 2023 is so crazy. I know we were born for this moment. We were made for this moment. We were made for this time. We were made for these cities. We were made for these communities. We were made for this family. Pastor, you don't know what my family is like. It's okay. You're, the next generation is going to be different because you chose to thrive in Jesus in dysfunction. Don't get bitter about it. Don't get bitter. I mean, it's okay. You've got emotions. And when someone does something wrong to you, there's nothing wrong with saying that's wrong. When someone abuses you, you, don't be afraid to call the police. You can call the police. When somebody steals from you, it's okay to do that. But don't let the pit define who you are. Let Jesus define who you are. And God is wanting to do that in our lives today at all of our campuses right now. You say, Pastor, I want to walk in the blessings of God regardless of my circumstance. If that's you, would you just raise your hand right now? I want to walk. I want God's dreams for my life, for my family. I want them to come true in my life, and I don't want to do anything that would stop that. Pastor, I want to walk in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If that's you, just go ahead and raise your hand. You want to walk in his righteousness, holy as unto the Lord, that God would make us holy and that we would live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. Here's what I believe, that in this, in this life and in our circumstances, if we would be faithful to Jesus, the circumstance will only exist to bring glory to God. It may be painful, but God is going to get the credit. And I want to I tell you something. In the Bible, the Bible tells us that God stores our tears in jars. I want you to know he will not waste your pain. He will not waste the pain of the pit of slavery, of imprisonment, or of false accusations, or betrayal by your brothers, or abandonment by your father, or, or for the father to be lied to, that your son was killed. God won't waste any of that. In fact, he will bring a great heritage, a great legacy if you'll place your trust in Jesus. Pathway, I came to encourage you today. I came to encourage you to continue in your journey. Don't be weary, don't be weary. Be encouraged today that God is at work. Don't wait until the circumstance is right for you to be encouraged, for you to be happy, but be joyful in all situations. And let's lift up the name of Jesus today. Father, I thank you for my friends today. I thank you for my brothers and sisters today. Lord, I thank you for the people who have gone public with their faith in Jesus today. And God, I thank you for my friends who are in very difficult circumstances today. 
looking for your voice, looking for your hand, for your deliverance. God, I pray that you would deliver and you would heal. And Father, you would take your people and you would bring them into the place that you've called them to be. And as we go, Father, that our heart would be held firmly in your hand, that we would never block, we would never block the benefit of God because we were impatient, because we doubted you, because we questioned you, but we would trust you every single step of the way, that we would thrive in our dysfunction, that we would thrive in our difficulty, that we would thrive in persecution. And Father, you would get all the credit for it. Father, we bless our brothers today. We bless our, our friends. We bless our neighbors. Father, whatever role that they have to play, Father, we pray that you would keep our hearts pure in your hand. Father, that we would not become embittered, calloused people, but we would be flexible in your hand and that the maximum number of people would come to know Jesus because of your good work in us. Lord, we declare that you are king. We, we declare that while we're in the pit, Father, you're still on the throne. We declare that while we're still in bondage, Father, you are free and you are setting us free. Father, I'm praying right now, Father, for families and marriages that are broken and going through difficulty. Father, we're thanking you that even right now you're bringing deliverance and healing and reconciliation. As your word comes true in our life, Father, we declare that you're on the throne and we're trusting you every single step of the way and we honor you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.